Hello class, Professor Seeger here. This is my lecture on the sonnet, in which I will deal with some basics of the form, a bit of historical context, and a couple theories and reasons for the elements of the form, as well as its changes throughout history. At this point in the program, please remove yourself from any distractions and gather a pen and paper to take notes. Pause this lecture while you gather your things. I'll wait. If the presentation goes too fast, do not hesitate to rewind as often as you need to. Commonly known as the Petrarchan Sonnet, the Italian Sonnet was a well-established form for nearly 100 years by the time Francisco Petrarch began its use of it in the mid-14th century. Rumored to have begun in Sicily, the Sonnet has a rich and varied history, perhaps more so than almost any other poetic form. While some critics see the sonnet as the birth of modern thought, others see it as a less serious poetic form due to its brevity and inability to create long, drawn-out conceits like the epic poem does. However, it is that very brevity, as well as the limitations of the form, that have drawn poets to it for over 500 years. Sure, it has fallen in and out of favor and been reinvented, but since its conception, almost every literary movement in the English language has its own sonneteers. And that is not even counting how the sonnet made its way to other languages like German, French, and Spanish, where it was adopted early in its history, and often before it made its way to England. The Italian sonnet originated in southern Italy around 1230, and it is easily identified by its formal structure, 14 lines and a rhyme scheme that allows slight variation. The first recorded practitioner is Giacomo de Lentino, a court official at the court of Emperor Frederick II, who lived from 1194 to 1250. Of course, it is not documented, but the sonnet is believed to have started as a musical form of eight lines, which was sung by Sicilian peasants. Dalentino is rumored to be the one who added the sestet, a major defining feature of the form. In the hands of Petrarch, whose work defines the form, Typical Italian sonnets begin with an octave, an eight-line stanza of A-B-B-A-A-B-B-A, and is followed by a sestet, a six-line stanza, with a C-D-C-D-C-D, or C-D-E-C-D-E rhyme scheme. This division of the rhyme generally coincides with a change in rhetorical strategy between the first and second parts. This change is normally called the poem's turn, or volta. Typically, the octave presented the speaker's situation or problem, while the sestet worked to resolve this problem. This convention of the turn lent the Italian sonnet to contemplative themes and subject matter, which is why George Oppenheimer called it the birth of modern thought. Its strict formal qualities and the required brevity of writing in only 14 lines ensured its popularity throughout history. According to George Oppenheimer, Frederick II, King of Sicily's reign, was characterized by a sense of open-mindedness, anti-clericalism, and scientific curiosity. He was working to divide the Catholic Church's influence from that of the monarchy and create an age of reason. It is interesting to note that the poetry, up until that point, was characterized by its use of abstract religious metaphor and allegory. The sonnet, on the other hand, was characterized by its first-person point of view, introspective nature, and its use of natural instead of religious metaphors and images. Part of the beauty of the sonnet lies in its unbalance. It is divided into unequal parts. The theories behind this division are numerous, but the effect of this slight unbalance in the Italian sonnet works to create a tension between the two parts, the octave and the sestet, that an equally divided sections would not provide. This is often said to be one of the sources of its contemplative nature. The relationship between these two parts is also important. The octave presents a problem or a concern of the speaker, whereas the sestet works to examine or resolve this concern. The change in rhyming words, as well as the pattern of the rhyme between these two sections, reinforces the change in rhetorical strategies. As you read more and more Italian sonnets, you will notice that even the rhyme scheme strategies between the two parts are typically different. The beginning octave relies on what is often called kissing rhymes, in which end rhymes come directly after one another, or they touch, or kiss. Whereas the rhyme scheme of the sestet 
in all its typical variations, never resorts to that kissing rhyme. These kissing rhymes work to show a continuity and connection between the lines of the first octave. It is possible that the close proximity of the rhymes works to also create an emotional connection and reaction in the reader, whereas the alternating rhymes of the sestet might suggest the reader and poet take a more logical and intellectual approach. Although the Italian sonnet is synonymous with the Petrarchan sonnet, it has been a popular form for a long time before Petrarch tried his hand at it. Here is one of De Lentino's early sonnets, before the form was completely formalized. Sonnet 11 So many lovers carry their love disease inside their hearts, where it cannot be seen. But I cannot conceal their fierce unease, so that it does not glimmer through my pain. I'm under just one woman's haughty eye. She neither stirs nor does a thing in truth unless my lady makes me some reply, because she can pronounce my life and death. My heart is hers, me too, all, all for her, and he who fails to listen to his heart can't live with people as he should or share. I suffer thus, am neither here nor there, unless my lady guides me though apart, unless my bit of spirit guides me here. Remember, this is a poem in translation, which may account for the strained rhyme scheme in places. You may, however, notice that although the rhyme scheme varies from the traditional Italian sonnet as we know it, the most important aspect, the volta, is already in place and is reinforced by the shift from four to three line stanzas in the De Latino poem above. You will also notice that although there is a minor shift in each stanza, the major turn is between lines eight and nine. You will also notice that this poem establishes one of the traditional themes of the sonnet, courtly love, which is much different and less physical than typical love. The early subject matter of the Italian sonnet at the hands of Petrarch owes much to the practice of courtly love, wherein an admirer devotes himself to a lady of high standing who is not his wife, using her as the inspiration for virtuous acts as he extols her beauty and virtue. It is important to note that this is not a sexual relationship. However, Italian sonnets have also been used to focus on a variety of themes, such as religious devotion and politics. Here are two versions of the same sonnet by Petrarch. You will notice quickly the stylistic differences and the different ways each translator deals with the form. You will notice that although Wyatt and Surrey are still working in the Italian sonnet form, they had to make accommodations to the differences in language, chiefly the fact that in Italian there were more words that ended with similar sounds and therefore it was easier to find end rhymes naturally. Although each author utilizes the volta at the end of the eighth line, Surrey changes the rhyme scheme of the ending sestet, creating a rhyme in the last two lines which seems to be the precursor to the changes that would occur in the English sonnet. What other differences do you notice between these two versions? The love that the long love that in my thought doth harbor, and in mine heart doth keep his residence, into my face presseth with bold pretense, and therein campeth, spreading his banner. She that me learneth to love and suffer, and wills that my trust and lust's negligence be reigned by reason, shame, and reverence, with his heartiness taketh displeasure. Wherewithal, Unto the heart's forest he fleeth, leaving his enterprise with pain and cry, and there him hideth and not appeareth. What may I do when my master feareth, but in the field with him to live or die? For good is the life ending faithfully. Remember, this Wyatt poem is in translation. Translated into English, this poem closely follows the criteria for an Italian sonnet, only deviating from the 11-syllable line by creating a regular iambic pentameter to coincide with natural English-speaking patterns. 
The first octave proposes that the speaker's love campeth within his heart. The rhyme between lust's negligence and reigned by reason, shame, and reverence strengthens the thematic difference between feeling shame for physical lust and the courtly love which privileges a combination of reason and reverence. The sestet, then, shows the speaker removed from temptations of the flesh through the metaphor of the heart as an isolated forest. By removing himself from his physical urges, the speaker is able to live and die with his master, the embodiment of true love. It is through this metaphoric and philo philosophical removal from the real world signified by the change in rhyming n-words that the speaker comes to the conclusion that good is the life ending faithfully. This resolves the poem, the rhyme scheme, and the conflict of sexual temptation presented in the first octave. It is the requirement of resolving the images and argument of the poem in six lines that leads to the sonnet's tendency towards brevity in an intimate tone, as in the metaphor comparing the heart to a forest. Now let's look at Surrey's version. Love that liveth and reigneth in my thought. Love that liveth and reigneth in my thought, that built his seat within my captive breast, clad in the arms wherein with me he fought. Oft in my face he doth his banner rest. She that me taught to love and suffer pain, my doubtful hope and eke my ho heart's desire with shamefast cloak to shadow and refrain, her smiling grace converteth straight to ire. And coward love then to the heart apace, taketh his flight, whereas he lurks and plains his purpose lost, and dare not show his face. For my lord's guilt thus faultless bide I pains, yet from my lord shall not my foot remove. Sweet is his death that takes his end by love. As you examine Surrey's version, please consider how his choices differ from Wyatt's. Also consider the effects these differences have on the meaning and emotional impact of the poem.